Can someone on Zoom confirm that they can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, thank you. David, you are now a co-host. You can let people in if they come later. All right, sounds good. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have a couple of minutes before the official class start time. Uh, anybody have any questions for me about previous material? Yeah. Can I ask a about the uh, you can ask a question about the assignment. I may or may not answer it. Uh, so about question four. I already asked you about Yep. Would that also apply to what? Yes. Yeah. So the question is um, in question four on the assignment, which is about searching in the two uh, sorted lists or sorted sets A and B. Um, trying to simulate fractional cascading using uh, bias search trees. Um, so the question was, does, uh, at least for the first part, should only the elements of A be in the bias search tree? And the answer is yes. And, um, and also only the intervals, that means that only the intervals defined by consecutive pairs of elements in A uh, get weights for, uh, for that problem. Other questions? Yep. So for the last question. The uh, last question. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, the number of the number of 
operation is needed to create tables mm -hmm. and one code for the two and two codes for the three. Yeah. Right? So do we consider the invariant that we put the class specific by detaching basically? No, for the last question, which is about persistence and about um, basically uh, getting a different performance out of the, the data structure. Um, you do have to change the data structure. So there's, you know, the way I taught it in class, we uh, fixed some specific things, table sizes and things. Um, to get what the question asked for, you have to change some, some parameter and then reanalyze with that new parameter. So basically, I won't consider my two credits, for example, the create has two credits. Do I change all of these as well? Um, well, I mean, you need to do redo the analysis with some credit scheme. So use whichever credit scheme works best for uh, whatever modification that you've you've made. Other questions? Okay. Good. Uh, I believe we are recording. Excellent. Okay, so last class, um, we started to talk about entropy. And so we had to define it. That's this formula here. Um, and the way to interpret this formula, right? So the, the P1 through Pn is a probability distribution over n things. In this course, it's usually the things that you might search for. So PI is the probability of searching for the i thing. Um, and you can then interpret this formula as if I happen to build a, if I'm able to build a binary search tree where searching for the i thing takes log one over PI time, then this is the expected uh, running time of that data structure, right? because this is the probability that I want to search for the i thing times the cost of searching for the i thing. So you can think of that as an expectation of a really good data structure. And Shannon's theorem says that, well, if, uh, if that's really what's happening is that the queries are coming in according to this distribution, P1 through Pn, then this is the best you can do. So if your data structure does this, then, uh, then you're, you're doing great. And there's a sort of empirical version of that, <clears throat> which doesn't talk about probability at all. And that's just when you're given a sequence of accesses uh, to all of the, uh, just some sequence of accesses to these N elements that are in your data structure. And then you can pretend that um, you, you can kind of imagine that there's probabilities by saying, well, look, count how many times I access the ith thing and divide that by the total number of accesses. That's kind of like the probability of accessing the ith thing. In fact, it's exactly the probability of getting the ith thing if I picked a random thing from this sequence. There's exactly mi things in this sequence which are, uh, are uh, equal to the, the ith key. And uh, so that makes this the empirical probability. And then this is one over the empirical probability. So it's, a, it's the same formula, but with empirical probabilities. So measured probabilities. And if you have a, uh, one thing to just point out, if you have this sequence happens to be a very long sequence, of uh, items that are really drawn according to some real underlying probability distribution, then these two things converge. So the empirical probability will converge to the, the underlying probability in that distribution. In fact, it happens very quickly. Okay, <clears throat> and we saw, yeah, it's easy if you know all the probabilities to build a, a structure that achieves this. It is also, um, even if you don't know all the probabilities, but you just happen to know them uh, and you happen to, to know what their ordering of the probabilities is, it's also fairly easy to do that using this two to the two to the i structure. Um, 
So now I want to look at the case where you don't know anything. So you have no idea about the, the probabilities. In fact, we will ignore probabilities and we'll just work with this thing. So uh, to do this, I'm going to introduce another parameter. It's called the, the working set. Okay, and so for the working set number, it's really about these access sequences. So I search for the first thing, search for the second thing, search for the third thing, fourth thing, and so on up to the, maybe there's a J thing, and then there's a I thing. So, the working set, number of x at time i, well, that is uh, the number of items accessed uh, since the last access to x in s1 up to s i minus one okay so <clears throat> this is something you measure at time i so what's the working set number of of x at time i well uh, you look at uh walk back in this sequence here. So everything here is some value that was searched for previously until you find the one uh, that is the, the most recent one. So the last one in the sequence that's equal to X. Okay. And now you look at how much time has elapsed since then. So I minus J and let's add one just to be, be clear, okay? Um, right, so it's basically how long has it been since you accessed X? That's the working set number of X at time I. And actually what we're really most interested in is we will be always looking at the working set number at time I of SI. So that's, think of that as I'm about to search for this thing. How long has it been since I saw it last? Uh, and just to be a little careful, this is not totally defined because, uh, or it's N if X was never accessed before. Okay. So the first time you access X, um, so if you've never seen it before, then you just say that the working set number is N. So it's like you accessed, well, it's, it's the worst it could possibly be. Yeah. Sorry, what is S? What is what? S. S1, S2, S3, S4, up to SM is the total, is a sequence of things that you're searching for in your data structure. Okay. So the same S1 through SM that you have here, where you count the, the thing that you use to count how many times you access each key and get the, the empirical probabilities. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, and now we'll say that the working set property That is if uh, the search for SI takes O of a log the working set time of I, okay? So what we'd like to get is a data structure that has this working set property that says, um, how long does it take us to, to perform this search? 
Well, it depends how long it was since we last saw this thing. If we've never seen it before, then uh, maybe it takes order log n time. So the first time we see it might take order log n time. But if we've seen it very recently, then it should be much faster. So for instance, if we, we saw it one step before, then this is, uh, well, log of one or log of two. Uh, so, so constant time. And you know, the longer it's been since we've seen it, the, the longer we're allowed to spend to, to search for it again. All right. Um, so we'll see a data structure that does this, <clears throat> but uh, let's, let's think about why, uh, what this has to do with entropy. Does it have anything to do with entropy? So, um, or why should it have something to do with, with entropy? So this entropy formula says that if the probability is big, close to one or close to a half or something, then it should be really fast to, uh, to search for something. Like if the probability of something is a half, then this says you should be able to find it in one step. Okay. Um, all right, so let's think about this for a minute. If the probability of something is a half, and then we take a, a, a sequence that's where the, each element is distributed according to that probability distribution, then, well, how many times do we expect to see it in a sequence of length m? m over two. All right, so we expect to see it half the time. And if we're thinking about working sets here, well, at time, if I'm going to do a search now and I'm searching for that thing, how long do you think it has been since I saw it before? Should be two steps in the past. Okay. So somehow, if, the, if, the, um, if something is a high probability element, then somehow its working set number seems to also tend to be small on, on average. In fact, let's, uh, let's just prove it. Let's, let's convince ourselves of, uh, of this, okay? So we're gonna look at, um, here's what we're uh, gonna do. So I just wanna know, um, so this is time one, time two, time three, up to time M. That's the length of this access sequence. And I would like to know, let's focus on a particular uh, key, KI. I wanna figure out what all the searches for KI are gonna cost in this working set structure. So ki appears mi times. Right, that's what that's what this uh, this says. So let's mark on this line the places where Ki appears. So these are the places where I end up searching for Ki. There's Mi of them. Now, uh, the working set number for this one, there's not much we can do about. It's N because we've never seen it before. Okay. But for this one, it's something that is basically this distance between these two things. Okay. So let's call that. Uh, let's call that T1. And then for this one, it's gonna be T2. And for this one, it's gonna be T3, T4, and so on, all the way up to, I guess this is gonna be T, something like M I minus one. Okay. And the cost of all our searches is gonna be log n for the first one, 
but then log of t1 for the second one, log of t2 for the, for the next one, log of t3, and so on, all the way up to log of t mi minus one, okay? So let's write that down. So cost of all searches for Ki, that's gonna be log n for the first one, and then some, uh, let's say j is equal to one to m i minus one log of t i. All right, uh, what can you tell me about this sum? So I'd like to say that it's small somehow. Yeah. Is it T I or T J? Sorry, T J. Yeah. So I would like to say that it's small somehow. So what do I have here? What does this sum look like? Um, well, let's let's draw. This is x. This is log x. Log x is a concave function, kind of looks like this. It's always increasing, but it's always increasing more and more slowly. Okay. And, you know, somewhere I have here T1, and the cost of that search is up here. It's this value. And somewhere I have, I don't know, T2, cost of that search is this value. And then maybe T3, the cost of that search is this value, okay? So these things, these things here, there's the, that's what that sum, that's supposed to represent this sum geometrically. And how big can this sum get? Well, what's the worst thing that can happen if I wanna make the sum as big as possible? What should these values T1, T2, and T3 look like? And T4 up to Tm minus one. In particular, if I even, even from this picture, are these values the worst ones that are possible? Or could you make it a little bit worse without even knowing what the numbers are? What's that? Yeah. So what do we, what do we have? Well, move it down the curve. We could take all of them and move it arbitrarily far down the curve to, to infinity, but we have a restriction, right? That uh, T1 plus T2 plus and so on, Tmi minus one is a less than or equal to, well, M. It's not more than the, the total time here, okay? So we can't just take them all and move them down because otherwise we'd violate this. We'd, this sum would get too big. But we can trade off one for another one. So for example, T1 is smaller than T3. So if I move T1 over a little bit to the right and move T3 exactly the same amount back to the left, then the sum stays the same. Now, what happens to these sticks though? Well, T1 goes from here to there. It's going up. T2 goes from here down to there. It's going down. So is that more or less? Does this go up more than this goes down? Yeah. So, um, that's the definition of the slope is, uh, if I move infinitesimally, uh, or, uh, 
a small delta to the right, then by how much does the value of the function increase or a small delta to the left, how much does it decrease? And the fact that log is concave means that the slope is higher here than it is here. So what I gain by moving this one to the right is more than what I lose by moving this one to the left. And so that says that, well, anytime we have whatever T1 to Tm minus one we pick here, um, if there's two of them that are different, then I can make the sum bigger by moving them closer together. Okay, in fact, by meeting halfway in the middle. And I can always do that as long as there's any two that are different. So then the maximum, the, the, the only time I can't do that is if there's no two that are different, meaning they're all the same. Well, if they're all the same, uh, that just means they're all equal to M over uh, MI basically. Okay. So this is, um, All that to say that this thing is less than or equal to, well, we always have the, the log n plus if each of these is just of m over mi, I'm gonna ignore the minus one for now. I'll be a little bit sloppy. Uh, each of these, Right, that's the worst thing that happens is they're all the, the same. So that breaks this up uh, evenly. This is log M over MI. Now that's nice because this is something that appears in the entropy formula. And even more, we have, mi minus one of these things, I'll be sloppy again and just say mi, just to make things simpler. Okay. So the cost of all the searches for key i is log n for the first one, plus the number of these searches times log of M over MI. So one over the empirical probability. Well, that's good. That means the cost of all the searches not just for MI, but for all of the I's is now gonna be the sum I equals one through N of this thing So this is n times log n. And this thing here is looking an awful lot like the empirical probability. The only difference is this is divided by m and this is not, which actually means that this thing is m times the empirical probability. which is what we, uh, what we would like, right? So M times the empirical probability, um, this empirical, sorry, the empirical entropy, this empirical entropy is supposed to be the cost of an average search. And if we do M searches, then this is what we, we get M times the, the cost of one of these average searches. Okay, good. So if we can get this working set property, then we will have a data structure that gives us uh, the empirical uh, search time, which is uh, basically the empirical probability, except for the first time we search for a key. Good. Um, and just remember this argument a little bit here. Um, there was a step where we went from the working set property to empirical entropy. And we saw that actually um, the working set property is better in a sense. 
because it's really only as bad as the empirical entropy when all the accesses to key i are somehow evenly spaced. If something weird happens, like the line looks like this, and all the accesses to key i are like this, all right in a row, then you get log n for the first one and a whole bunch of constants for the other ones. So, um, so this, this working set thing is, is, uh, can only be better than the empirical entropy. Um, it's only as bad if things are perfectly evenly uh, distributed. Okay, so how do we get that? Well, you already almost know. Uh, So this is a result of uh, Iacono from, I don't know, the early 2000s. Um, call it Iacono's working set structure. And this is what it looks like. It's a bunch of trees. Your favorite binary search trees, the ones that can store n elements and do uh, adding, removing, and deleting in log n time. Tree one, tree two, tree, uh, actually let's call it tree zero, tree one, tree two, tree three, and so on, all the way up to T. K for some K. And uh, this tree has size uh, two. This tree has size four. How big is this tree? It's 16. And this one? 256, and then, so this one has size two to the two to the zero, this one has size two to the two to the one, two to the two to the two, so that's two to the four, two to the eight, two to the uh, 16, and then the next one is gonna be two to the 32, so about 4 billion, um, and then bigger after that. Okay, <clears throat> good. So uh, this is the, the layout of the, the structure. And in addition to that, linked in with these uh, trees, so for each tree, there's also gonna be a Q um, that stores the elements of the, the, the tree, basically. And, and that's gonna be in the order that they were uh, most recently accessed. All right, so uh, here's how the structure works. If I wanna search for some value X, I search in this thing. I search in this one. If I don't find it, I search in this one. And if I don't find it, I search in this one. And if I don't find it, I search in this one. Until eventually I reach something where I find X. So if I find that in structure, let's say group G, then the time that that takes is two to the zero, so log of this size of this thing, which is just two to the zero plus log of the size of this thing, which is two to the one, two to the two and so on, up to two to the G. Um, so that's how long it takes me to find this thing. Um, when I find it here, I also find it in its Q. 
Now I take X out of this tree, remove it. And this is a binary search tree. So the time it takes to do that is about the same as the time it takes me to find it. I remove it from the queue and I insert it up here. So X goes right in the front. Why would I want to do that? Well, because at this point, I just searched for X. If I search for it again real soon, I want it to be fast. That's what the working set property needs. Okay, but now there's a problem because an X goes in here right at the front of this queue. But now there's a problem because there's three things in this tree and there's only supposed to be two. That's okay. We go take the last thing from the queue, remove it from the tree as well, and uh, insert it here, right? So the last thing from the queue here gets inserted into this structure. It goes at the front of this queue. Then the last one from here uh, gets removed from these two places, put in this thing, the last one from here, and so on. Until eventually we get back to this group, which now has one element too few in it. And so the one that we take from the end here fills that gap and we're done. Okay, and all of this, because each of these things is growing doubly exponentially, and the amount of work that we spend is the log of the, the size of one of these things, that means that the amount of work is growing exponentially. So it's all dominated by the amount of work we do here, which is uh, this two to the G. So uh, if we find X in uh, tree G, that takes two to the G time. Now, we would like to say that takes something to do with the working set number of X. Yep. Uh, so you don't search in the, I mean, the, the queue and the tree are linked to each other. So that, uh, there's a, in fact, they could all be the same thing. So you think of the tree has nodes, one for each element. And those nodes have left and right child pointers and parent pointers for being in the tree, but they also have next pointer and previous pointer for being in the queue. So when I find it in the tree, I'm also really finding it in the queue at the same time. And I can splice it out of the queue if the queue is just a doubly linked list and, uh, and there's no, no problem there. And the same thing here, when I look in the queue at the last element, that also gives me a pointer to it in the, the tree. So in fact, it's really, you're only, well, you're really searching for X. Um, for the other elements, you don't actually have to find them when you wanna delete them, but you do need to insert them in the, the next tree. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, um, we've sort of seen this analysis already. If it takes me all the way to group G uh, to find X, then either this is the first time I've ever searched for X, or if I've searched for, so, so for that one, then the working set number is, is N, um, or I've searched for X before, and how many, how long has it been? How many other elements have I searched for? since searching for X, well, if X is all the way down here, that means I've searched for all these other things more recently than X, right? The only way something moves down here is when you search for something else, you know, more recently than, than it. In particular, I have searched for all the two to the two to the G minus one elements in this tree more recently than I have searched for X. So if I have to go all the way to group G to find X, 
That means the working set number for X is bigger than or equal to two to the two to the G minus one, which means the log of the working set number of X is bigger than or equal to two to the G minus one, which is, you know, two to the G divided by two or here, one half, yes. So I find X in time O of two to the G and the log of its working set number is theta two of the two to the G. Okay. So this does indeed get you the working set property. Um, and as for the first time I searched for X, well, I don't know where it is that, I mean, the structure was built just by putting things wherever they, they went and still it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, the search is dominated by the size of the largest structure you end up searching in and none of them is, has size larger than N. So the, the search time is log N for the first search. Okay. So, um, so there you, you get it that uh, this structure um, lets you, uh, it gives you the working set property, um, which means that it lets you access this whole sequence in time proportional to M times this empirical entropy. Very easy. Questions? Yeah. Where uh, here? Yeah. Yeah, that's just because I found X in this structure, G, um, but I don't know how far down it is in the Q of this structure. So in particular, the only thing that I'm certain of is that everything in this structure was accessed more recently than X. And that's two to the, there's two to the two to the G minus one things in there. Um, if I wanna be more precise, I could also add up all these things, but that's really not gonna add much. This is the, by far the biggest uh, contributor. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So now we're going to uh, step a little bit out of the realm of data structures, because I wanna show you, uh, an application of this idea, which is old and really practical. And we'll also see something uh, really uh, cool. Um, and now we're, we're really in the, gonna enter the, the practical realm because what I wanna do now is talk about compression. Data compression. And I want to uh, compress a sequence S1 through SM. Again, these are uh, these are from some universe of size n of n possible things. Okay. And all right, <clears throat> good. Uh, so, I mean, now we're, we're firmly in the, the realm of, uh, of entropy because when you talk about data compression, then you really you talk about entropy. In fact, it, it's what entropy was designed to, to study compression and, and communication. Uh, and it's gonna use this working set property um, and a little, little more. In fact, it's, it's kind of, it's just a very slick, uh, much more slick implementation of this, this whole thing. But first, uh, a little bit about coding, which is something we'll call the Elias code for positive integers. So let's say I wanna be able to uh, write down um, a 
for each positive integer, I want to be able to write down a bit string that you recognize as that, that integer. Okay? Um, and I'll, I'll say that I want this code to be prefix free, meaning that if I write down the bit string for some integer i, and immediately after that, I write down the bit string for some integer j, even if all you see is the concatenation of these two strings, you immediately recognize after reading this that, ah, now this is i, and now a new thing is starting, this is j. So Elias, uh, sort of a famous name in, in information theory has a code for these things. So we're looking at wants to encode all the positive integers. So here's a, um, a code for positive uh, integers that you might recognize. Uh, oh, sorry. I can't count. <clears throat> um, Okay, so this is the integer one, this is the integer two, integer three, four, and so on. Uh, you hopefully recognize this. This is just the, the binary encoding of the integers. The problem is that this is not a prefix free code. If I show you this, is that a one followed by another one, or is that a three? So um, Elias's idea was to look at the number of bits in each of these things. And in front of that, put that many zeros minus one. So notice all of these start with a one. So that's helpful. So before each one, I'll put the same number of zeros less one. Okay, so. In front of this one, there's no zeros. In front of this one, this has two bits, so I put one zero. This also has two bits, so I put one zero. But this one has three bits, so I put two zeros. Three bits, two zeros, two zeros, two zeros. And then finally, this one has four bits, so I put three zeros. Okay. And now, um, you should be able to see that this is prefix free, that I can decode this um, in the, the following way. Uh, so I start reading the string and I count how many zeros I see until I get the first one. So for instance, if I started to read this string, I see zero, zero, one. The fact that I read two zeros means that I still have two more bits to read before the end of this string. And that's how I know that the string is over. And similarly here, zero, one, I read one zero, which means I have one more bit to read to, to finish decoding this thing. And then decoding it is easy because it's just the normal encoding of, of integers. And even for this one, that's true. I don't read any zeros. I see a one, don't read any more, just decode what, what I have now, just this one. Um, all right, and so uh, so how long are these codes? So the the code for uh, the integer i, well, the code for one has length one, and one happens to be uh, log of two, so I think it's gonna be something like log of i plus one. Right, so this guy here, uh, 
Yeah, log of i plus one. Yeah, log of i plus one. Good. Okay, so that's for the actual integer part of the code. Uh, then there's this thing that comes before it, which is uh, just one one less than than the other thing, right? So that gives me uh, same thing as this without the um, the extra one. So that's like two log i plus one. Not bad. So somehow log to encode i seemed like you needed at least log i. In fact, to encode all the things, it is true that you need at least log i. This gets you two log i. So you could stop there and say, that's good enough. But actually, <clears throat> uh, what is this? What are these zeros here? I mean, what are these three zeros telling me? Well, they're telling me a number. They're telling me the number three. But that's like a really silly way to encode the number three, isn't it? To, 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 I mean, that's the unary encoding. So to encode the number n, I'd need n zeros when I could encode the number n using a normal thing of, of log n things. Okay. So, the second step in Elias's code is to realize these things that you're putting here, they're just integers also. Use the same code on them. The difference is these integers don't go all the way up to, to i, these integers are more like log i. So if I'm encoding i, I have the normal integer encoding of i plus some compact encoding of uh, log i, the number of these zeros. So, do that and you get something more like log i plus two log log i i don't know plus uh plus something small so the important thing is this this log i okay all right <clears throat> good so that's one uh one piece that we, we need, that I can encode the integer i using about log i bits plus some lower order thing. So just so I'm not lying at all, I will just say log i plus o of log log i. Yep. Yeah, for the same reason, right? Right, so, so, you know, all I'm doing is replacing this number of zeros, I don't know, let's call it R, with the binary, so this is, uh, this is R is five, so one, two, three, four, five, you have to add one because of that thing with no zeros, but so, so for, for this, I need to encode the integer six, okay, well, what's the encoding of the integer six? That's a one, one, zero, 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 right? That is four plus two, uh, six. Um, and the Elias code for that says prefix this thing with two less zeros. This is for the encoding of, right? So in the, in the first code, you would have something one, two, three, four, five, then a one, and then five more things, right? This would be the, the basic code that I showed you first. But now, instead of encoding these, these uh, five uh, zeros, I mean, instead of encoding with these five zeros, you just encode the number six. This is what the encoding of the number six looks like. And then that tells you how many things to read after that. Okay. So it's prefix free because, well, this is prefix free. And once you know this, you know how much the, how long the rest of the code is. Okay. 
And well, now you uh, know almost everything. Yeah. This one here? Okay, so uh, the, the big picture, if I want to encode I, there's about log I bits that is just the normal binary encoding of I always starts with a one, okay? Then I have to put something in front of that that tells you how many bits there are here. Well, what is that number that I'm putting in front of it? It's log of I, it's, it's, right, it's, it's this number here, okay? So that, if I just use the normal, the not sort of recursive version of the Elias code, I can do that with two times the log of whatever number I'm trying to encode. That's two times the log of this number. That's where the, the log log comes from. Okay. And if you want to go deeper, you can apply the same thing recursively here and you get something that um, there's log i plus log log i plus log 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 i plus this whatever number of log i is plus something that is smaller than all of that. Okay. Um, but in practice, really, the, this, is, this is where you stop. All right. So way back in the 70s, some heavy hitters in the, actually in the field of data structures came up with a beautiful compression technique based on this, it's called move to front compression. So what you do is you start with a list that has all the possible things you want to encode. So the, the N things that you want to encode. Okay. Um, so a list is indexed by the integers one up to, to n. And you put those things in in any order you want in the list initially. Okay. So now I want to, comp I, I want to compress some sequence like this. So to compress the first element of the sequence, I'm just gonna tell you where it is in the list. That's an integer between one and N. It's some value I. So I will use this code, use log I bits plus O of log log I bits to tell you what the index is of that thing in the list. So for instance here, if I wanted to uh, say, this is the key that I'm, this is the, the thing that I'm encoding. If S1 is K4, well, in this case, I would do the Elias code for four. And if you're trying to decode this, you read that. You have started with the same list that, that I started with. Um, you say, okay, good. That first thing that I was sent was this fourth element in the list. Now, of course, you don't just leave this list alone. That would not be good. Um, what do you think you do? After you encode, you realize that this is the thing that I, this is the first element I'm searching for, or the first element I'm encoding. What do you do? Move it to the front. Yeah, move it to the front. So take it out, put it on the front. It now has index one. and so on, okay? And so now, look what happens. <clears throat> um, look in this sequence. The first time you see some value X, you don't know where it is in this list. You've never touched it before. It kind of depends on what list you started with, but it's not more than at position N. So it won't cost you more than log n plus O of log log n. 
to encode it. But the next time you see X, it's gonna be at some position in this list. Well, first time you accessed it, you moved it to the front. Maybe in the meantime, it's moved down the list, but it has not moved further down the list than the number of things that you accessed in between here. So that second time that you access it, that's exactly the log of the working set number. And then it moves to the front and the same sort of thing happens again. Okay. So this gives you the exact analysis that we, we did for the working set structure shows that move to front compression gives you um, uh, well, uh, an encoding in which the, the length of this whole sequence is going to be, uh, it's gonna look like this. So the number of bits to encode everything is n log n. That's to count for the first time you access each of the n things. You don't have really any control over that. Plus, uh, M times, well, this empirical entropy. Uh, plus some uh, little order term in that empirical entropy. So <clears throat> the second term is the empirical entropy, but instead of logs everywhere, it's log logs. And that's just to make up for, that's just to count for, for this extra stuff that you get. Okay. So there's a really simple scheme. Can anyone hear him? Sir, your sound cut. Yeah, I lost the audio as well, yeah. We can hear you now. Yes. Uh, really? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, now you're getting it through the computer microphone, so it's going to get louder and quieter as I walk away. Uh, but the battery died in the, the transmitter. Um, okay. So right. The last thing we heard was that there's a simple. The last thing you heard was what? That there's a simple. And then you cut off. Yeah. So it's a simple, a simple data compression scheme that um, you can walk away and still remember all the, the sort of bits and pieces of it. You know, it's one of these desert island things. If you got stuck on a desert island, you probably would remember enough uh, that you could implement this and uh, concisely encode the messages that you put in the, the bottle that you send away. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So that's that's cool, and it, it, it gives you um, an encoding which is as good as the empirical entropy. Um, but if you know a little bit about data compression, you'll realize uh, that's actually not that impressive. So most data compression things do that, um, and what they want to typically do is do better than empirical entropy, at least for uh, for uh, real sort of real life things like English text is a sort of classic example. And that's where, but remember, um, there was some slack here because what I showed, what we showed is that move the front compression, actually the time, the, the number of bits it takes to encode something is the working set, log of the working set number. 
um, which as a side effect gives you the empirical entropy for free in the worst case. So what you would like is, well, I had a picture of it here, where you would like, you know, if you have something you're trying to encode, and here are the occurrences to X all nicely evenly spaced, you'd like to sort of mash it up maybe, mix it up so that it looks more like this. All the occurrences of X come together, in which case the working set, the, taking the, the sum of the logs of the working set numbers of this is gonna be much smaller. So how do you take a message like this and turn it into something like this? This is the cool part, the really cool part of today's lecture. Um, I don't know if you've seen this before. Uh, it's called the Burroughs. Well, I know most of you haven't seen this before. Wheeler transform. So it takes a string and shuffles it that makes it look unrecognizable. But if this tends to be things for things like English text, uh, tends to take it from a situation that looks like this, where you know maybe these are the occurrences of the letter E in the text all evenly spaced out. And suddenly after this transform, it looks more like this. You get a bunch of them in a row here and some space some depth for a while, and then a bunch more in a row. Depth for a while. How does it do that? So, uh, impossible to do for me to do on the board a large example of, of this, but I, I'll show you a small example. So, you have the string that you want to encode. And um, there's sort of way around it, but the easiest way to describe it is you also have a special end of string character that only appears at the end of the string. And uh, well, I mean, the, the string has letters, and you can decide what alphabetical order is for your letters. Uh, we'll use normal English one. The only thing is that we'll get that uh, this one here, the end of string character, it's, it is bigger than every other letter. So if I sort and something starts with the end of the string character, then it would be the last thing in the sort of order. So you take your string and you take all its uh, cyclic rotations. So uh, this is the original string, banana. But now I will also take anana dollar b. I'll also take nana dollar b a. Also take anana dollar b n. Also take na dollar na. Also, uh, uh, dollar uh, 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 dollar uh, 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 Okay, good. Um, now let's sort these strings. Uh, so if I sort these strings, the ones with A's come first.
Then the bees. Pat, wouldn't the last one with the dollar sign be above the A's? Uh, this one? Yeah, because it has the special dollar character. Dollar sign banana. Yeah, wouldn't that be on top of the, a, the A's if we sorted them all? Sure. Because it starts with the special character, so that would be sorted above the letter A. No, it's last. So the special character is greater than every other letter in the alphabet. Oh, okay. I understood it as the opposite, my bad. Um, okay, so banana, uh, then we've got the nana, nana, dollar, uh, nana, dollar, nana, and then finally, I think the last one is dollar. Did I forget anything? One, two, three. Okay, that's all sorted. And now, take this string here. Take the last character in each string. This is the Burroughs Wheeler transform. This is the thing that you're going to encode. Now, um, why, so a couple of things. Big one is, but this string is gibberish. What's the point of encoding this string? It's not the string that I am interested in. Um, so we'll show remarkably that given this string, you can recover the original string. Now, that's one thing, and we still have to show that. The other is, well, why did you want to do this? This string is still has exactly the same set of letters as the other string. Um, so doing this transform doesn't change the empirical entropy at all exactly the same because the same letters occur the same number of times. There just is some weird permutation now. But if you think about it, this, this cyclic rotation here um, and the, the way we're sorting. So the last letter, we did these cyclic rotations. So that means like the last letter in this string is what comes um, just before this, uh, this first part, the part that we sorted on. Okay. So if you think of English, for example, so you do this cyclic rotate, you have long English text, you do these cyclic rotations, and somewhere in that long list, and then you sort. Somewhere in that long list of things, you will see stuff like And now, what is that contributing to the encoding, right? So this is stuff that's close in sorted order. What is that contributing to the encoding? Well, it's whatever the last letter is here. But the last letter that, that's here is actually the letter that appears just before these things. What do you think that last letter is? T. If you see, if you see a H, A, H, E, whatever in English, there's only a handful of things that can they can show up before that T and S. Um, and so that's somehow going to force the T's into a whole bunch of groups that somehow should force them into a small number of really close together places. I mean, the best thing we could hope for is if we actually, instead of using the last column, if we could use the first column, that would be great because. Uh, that's just all the A's followed by all the B's followed by all the C's followed by all the C's. That would be the, the best you could ever hope for. Um, we can't quite get that, but instead we can get things, letters sorted by what follows them in the text. Because for things like English, that, that means a lot. And it's a big difference. 
All right. Um, and so when you do this, you get you do this Gros Wheeler transform, you get this super highly compressible uh, string. Now, how do we get this thing back? How do I go from here? So, so let's say I compress this string using move to front compression. It compresses really well because look, all the A's are together. Um, on the other end, I decode it and I get this. But now I would like to get actually the original string. How am I going to do that? Well, what I'd like to do is build this whole table that I made here. I want to reconstruct this whole table. And I have the last row. That's something. And well, I know one thing that I can reconstruct, another row that I can reconstruct easily. What's that? Yeah. The first row. The first row. Because the first row is a permutation of these letters that I have. And it's not just any permutation, it's actually the sorted permutation. So I just take this thing and sort it, and I'll get the first row. Well, that's the first row. Now, take this string that you gave me and put it just before that. What's the justification for doing that? Oh, uh, well, um, justification is actually that because this thing is cyclic, this last row kind of does appear just before this. So now I have a whole bunch of strings of length two. Sort those. That anything? That's the first two columns. Why is that the first two columns? Well, because when I took the last thing and put it in front of the first thing, I actually created every uh, pair of consecutive letters in the, the right order. That means, and since every string uh, every possible rotation of this thing is, is in this list. That means when I sort those two things, just those two, I'll get exactly the same order as I would have got if I sorted the full strings. Okay. And now we continue. Take that last row again, right? Because it comes before the, the last column again. It comes before the first two columns. Sort. And now we have the first one. Repeat this. Eventually, you'll get back the whole table. What is the string that you actually want from this table? It's the one that ends in the dollar sign. So the dollar sign is the end of string character. And this is the marker. Yep. So we do that. Uh, 
Yeah, so you do repeat this each time you get a longer and longer, you get another column of this table until eventually you have the whole table. Then one of the rows of the table ends with the dollar sign. That row is the string you, you want. Well, so each time you do it, you get, you, you lengthen, uh, you increase the number of columns by, uh, by one. So you do it whatever the length of the original message was. And this is a remarkable algorithm. Uh, and this goes back uh, 30, 40 years now. Gorgeous. It's, um, I think it's used in BZIP, the, the utility. Uh, unfortunately, it's not used in, and it's actually, it's really the sort of the best general purpose compression uh, algorithm out there. Uh, the only problem is it's encumbered by software patents, so it doesn't get used everywhere that it, uh, it should. Um, but it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And although I showed you here the way you do this by building this giant table, you can actually do the entire thing in linear time without building this whole table. So it's actually fast to, to decode. Um, when we start looking at things like suffix trees and suffix arrays, we'll see um, we'll see the ideas that could be used to, to do this in linear time instead of this sort of clunky way that uh, that we did it here. Um, that's, uh, I think, a good place for us to, to stop today.